Today on Up at Noon. Final Fantasy XV didn't suffer the Duke Nukem Forever curse. Rogue One is already beating Suicide Squad and Doctor Strange records. And of course, we're opening up our Star Wars toys and playing with them like adults do. This is Up at Noon. Yo, 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 what's up? What's up, 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 Hey everybody, welcome to Up at Noon. Up at Noon is a weekly show where we get real weird and talk about toys and junk food and movies and comic books and pop culture and all that kind of stuff. That's right. We are live every Thursday at noon Pacific time on IGN.com, YouTube.com slash IGN, IGN's Facebook, our PS4, Xbox One, Roku, Apple TV apps, mm -hmm. as well as Twitch.tv slash IGN. And I think I said all of them. Yeah, we just got added to the Sega channel, which was a 90s yeah. thing you can plug your Genesis in. And uh, coming up soon in Q4, we're coming to the Play-Doh Fun Factory, which apparently streams video now. Uh, congratulations, millennials. We did it. Uh, anyway, uh, we're also on Twitter. We use the hashtag up at noon to track our comments and hate speech and things like that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we just got one from I Work Stiff Kid. He says, going to watch up at noon when it actually airs live. Love you guys. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, if you can catch this show live, that, which you're doing right now, that's pretty awesome. If you watch it afterwards, thank you so much for doing that as well. Uh, awesome week. Awesome year for games. Awesome year for everything uh, except for humanity. That sucked. But entertainment-wise, this was a hoot. Uh, we got a great game this week. In fact, two of them came out within a week of each other. We got Final Fantasy XV this week. We got The Last Guardian next week. I don't know what we did to deserve this. Both of these games have been in development for longer than I think you and I combined have been working professionally in the games industry. Yeah. No, that's one of those, like, uh, that is the... That's the what now. Like, yeah. I guess I guess now we wait for Cyberpunk 2077, which is probably going to come out closer to 2077. Yeah. Um, but in the meantime, we have a sponsor this week. Yeah, we are sponsored by uh, Gillette. They are doing Rogue One Razors. Star, Star Wars razors, you can shave your face. Every, every, every hero has a face. Did you know that? Some of those faces grow some hair on them. Uh, Brian over here, uh, you're not much of a razor boy. I, I use, I use them a, for, the, for the odds and ends, like the you're up here. Kind of a scruffle up, I guess, there. I'm kind but of a me, scruff from top to bottom. I like to be as aerodynamic as possible, which is why my hair goes this direction. But you I keep my you face. You also can't grow a beard. That's also part of the issue. Bad so, anyway, beard. if you can't grow a beard. <laughs> Get some Star Wars razors and fix your face. That's true. Um, anyway, on the uh, on the topic of uh, Final Fantasy XV, it came out. Final Fantasy came out after that was uh, announced literally over a decade ago. Is that, that was, insane? I think, was, I think it was May twenty first, two thousand six. I don't think I'd even hit puberty then. That was a long time ago. So like, let's let's talk about this real quick because I think it's like kind of amazing to go back in time and 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 see where we were. But also like logistically to keep the lights on in a video game studio for that long. And I know Square Enix has uh, got other stuff going on. They put out a bunch of other other Final Fantasy things. We saw them come to iOS and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you look at like a Last Guardian situation. Like this game would have to sell billions of copies to make that kind of money back. Yeah. Like I don't know what it what it's like to even like the toilet paper and just like the just the the sort of medicine cabinet budget of just running an office full of people working on it. Yeah, there's always the weird things you don't you don't think about that cost money. Yeah. Uh, but in any case, uh, Final Fantasy 15 is finally out, and uh, thankfully it did not suffer the fate of, you know, other uh, long long awaited games like oh I don't know Duke Nukem Forever, yep. which was in development for 13 years. Uh, Final is, Fantasy 15 is sitting at 84 percent on Metacritic. Uh, it's got yep. an 8.0 from users, uh, which is pretty awesome, by the way. To see uh, there's not a ton of discrepancies between those two numbers. If you look at something like Call of Duty, it's all over the place, right? Yeah. Um, so but yeah. So let's take a look at some of the reviews. Um, my old alma mater, Destructoid, uh, said, having only been available for two days, Square Enix announces that Final Fantasy 15 has shipped over five million copies worldwide in both physical and digital formats. Yeah. Already eclipses the halfway mark to the 10 million sales that Square Enix so, yeah. is hoping for. So it's doing well. This isn't the Final Fantasy. No, definitely not. Yeah. Before we get into the critical reception thing, I think it's immensely important. You know, it's it's really good to love games and to give them great reviews and play the hell out of them and tell all your friends about how great they are. But at the end of the day, this is a business. And if their projection is 10 million and they sold 5 million in 24 hours physically and digitally, uh, it's pretty safe to say that they're well on their way to hit the, hitting their goal. This is going to be a long tail game. This is going to be the kind of game that people are playing and talking about for a very, very long time. So that's kind of awesome. Like, this is not just a critical darling. This is going to make yeah. a lot of money as well. So that's good, yeah. Um, yeah, and then we get to wait another 15 years for Final Fantasy 16. That's so. true. Um, but yeah, on to the, uh, oh, oh, my favorite gaming publication, Time Magazine. Yeah. The number one gaming source. Um, well, I actually threw this one in here because I think it's important to note that uh, as video games are getting bigger, they're becoming unavoidable. And something like Final Fantasy 15, which has been around for all of time, no pun intended, uh -huh. uh, gets a really big write-up in Time Magazine, which I think is huge, you know? 
Yeah. So yeah, they have a lot of great quotes here. One of them is basically talking about how long it's been, but uh, it's lively, focused, and fully realized. Something wonderful and probable must have happened towards the end of the Topsy Turvy decade. It's taken Square Enix to finally produce a Final Fantasy worth crowing about. Crowing about. Thank director Hajime Tabata for somehow writing the ship. So that's been the sort of running theme about this. Is like it delivered. It's not like it's okay. People have found some sort of niggling little things that they don't like yeah. about it. Some people are beating it faster than they than they kind of expect. Yeah. I remember reading stories about people being like, "Oh, I finished it in like twenty five hours or forty hours." Uh, go in and hundred percent it. You'll find more to uncover there. But yeah, this is delivering on all fronts. So let's yeah. take a look at some more. Uh, uh, Polygon over yeah. here. They had some good things to say. It hums with an energy and compassion that I loved, a sense of camaraderie, friendship, and adventure that fills an old and struggling formula with new relevance. That's really what I'm looking forward to. Yeah. Uh, I just I want to find out who these dudes are. These guys in this in this car. Uh, I'm sure there's going to be like weird magic fights that are going to be big and epic and very JRPG-ish. But I'm excited about just like I want that camaraderie. Like, well, we I don't wanna... really get a lot of like games that star sort of like four interchangeable protagonists that have that much of a difference in personality outside of like Ninja Turtles, right? Yeah. And even that's kind of hokey and funny and cartoony. Yeah, and they don't have hair, but these guys in Final Fantasy that's have true. great hair. Uh, IGN.com, you know never, that website. Never heard of it. Yeah. Uh, there is so so much good here, so much heart, especially in relationships between Noctis and his sworn brothers. Again, this is what I want. Like, I don't... I, people can go and, you know, talk my ear off about, like, battle systems and how much has changed, but it's like the fact that this is just... That this has heart and this is like a, yeah. this is a game with soul is really nice for me. Also, uh, I want to point out like this this thin line that these guys are walking on making this game. They've been really struggling for a very long time of bringing in both the hardcore generational Final Fantasy fans and the kind of like casual or even lapsed ones. Like I know I played a lot in the Super Nintendo era and mm -hmm. dabbled in some of the other ones after that. Yeah. But in terms of being like, I don't have the time for another like seventy hour RPG. But I'm seeing stuff about this one and I'm like, I'm gonna get back in there. Yeah. Uh, U.S. Gamer said, I was really skeptical that Final Fantasy XV could ever be successful, but despite some real flaws, it ultimately won me over. I warmed the characters over the course of my many camping trips. I like that there are, is camping. Mm -hmm. uh, found more than I was expecting in the open world and have enjoyed some bombastic set pieces. Yeah. So, yeah. That good, sounds like it's just stuff. a damn awesome adventure I want to go on. Yeah. Games Radar says, even when it stumbles, Final Fantasy XV's ambitious open world fast-paced combat and the humanity of its four leads make it a fascinating adventure to behold. Hell yeah. Yeah. This is great. Psycats is a fun game with great atmosphere and characters. 9 out of 10. It's at the same time not your classic Final Fantasy game, but still keeps a Final Fantasy feel to it. Yeah, um, so this is like kind of pointing out that like the users are loving this too. Now, obviously, every user review section is bombarded with people being like, negative 4 out of 10, yeah. doesn't good look good. I was going to say, I don't read Psycat's uh, website. I don't know who, I, I didn't know I think Psycat should launch a website because I yeah. think he writes Wasn't Psycat well. featured on the hit Sugar Ray song, Fly? That's true. Yes. Anyway, uh, yeah, LLSR says, the most beautiful fictional world ever created for a game is here, striking characters. Uh, it is Return of King for RPGs. Something really interesting I want to point out is like, it has got to be so terrifying to have such a beloved franchise, and to be like, how do you modernize it? And you know, how do you you, you have to break yeah. some eggs, you have to kill some darlings, like you have to do stuff to change it and modernize it. But obviously, there's going to be you know, there's going to be you know pushback on that. One of the things that I loved about Metal Gear Solid Five was that it pretty much scrapped the entire structure of how that that game feels. Yeah. Like yeah. they were like, it's okay to get loud here. They were taking cues from, you know, Far Cry and, and GTA, and it's mm -hmm. like, it shows a certain amount of kind of humility for a massively successful IP to be like, I know that we're a beloved 35-year-old franchise, but maybe, maybe we should take some cues for more modern stuff. Totally, you know? and I think the interesting thing about Metal Gear is that people were, mo the hardcore fans were more bummed about like the lack of the story stuff, yeah. but in terms of gameplay, uh, people weren't too hard on that. I was actually way more open to it than, than ever before. Yeah. So that's why I'm excited about this Final Fantasy yeah. game. I mean, I haven't played a Final Fantasy in I don't even know how long, so yeah. I'm excited to jump in this. Um, by the sheet says... By the sheet! 10, the game <laughs> of 2016. For those who did not root for the game, I think it will be Masterpiece. Um, cool. Yeah, yeah so I love there that. we go. Uh, we got a tweet from uh, Dan Simmons. He says, when are we going to start hearing more about the Final Fantasy VII remake? I feel like that was a good thing they threw at uh, the PlayStation E3 mm -hmm. press conference two totally. years ago. Uh, got us going, got us thinking about it. Then we got those weird news articles sort of that like they're trickling it out in pieces and it's going to be episodic. I don't know how that's going to work, but I have faith in them. But I think it's a little odd that like um, now... I, we're maybe ready to talk about that. This was the big elephant in the room. Like they had to focus mm -hmm. on this. They had to get this out there. People love it. Critics are happy about it. Like, when do we find out more about Final Fantasy VII? Do you think it's PSX? 
Uh, I feel like that would, kinda, that would kind of cannibalize sales of this, you know, or maybe it would, it would build hype for it. Um, I think they also just don't want to, they don't want to spoil too much. Like, mm -hmm. we've kind of gotten a, we've got a, uh, gotten a glimpse of that, like, cinematic trailer, which was, like, that gave everyone chills. Like, yep. my fiance was crying over that. Like, that was her Star Wars trailer. Like, that was the thing that was, she was like, oh my god, that's my thing. Um, I was excited about that, and it just kind of like, hey... Remember Final Fantasy VII? Like, oh yeah, you totally do. Right, so, right. Um, but I think that also, like, it's almost a known quantity, and the more they show off about it, the more it's going to kind of, like, chip away at the hype. So, I don't know. I hope that we see something at E3 and maybe get a solid release date. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the episodic thing could be really good because that'll keep people... Uh, obviously, they're kind of they're kind of double-dipping in terms of money, but also, like, uh, you know, it's, it's hard to be like, hey, uh, water cooler talk about a massive, sprawling you know, dozens of hours long JRPG, but to yeah. be like a thing that, you know, people binge watch Netflix seasons. Yeah, I think it's odd because if you look at like remakes in general and the way that like they're they're sort of like shuffled out and promoted, uh, you're always wa walking that weird line between like, we know what this game is already because yeah. we played it, but we don't want to spoil all the new stuff in it too. I mean, I like the idea that even like casual people can jump on Final Fantasy VII and play it for play it for a second and you know get to that point, get to the end of it. You know, like they've yeah. like Square has done this with uh, with Hitman, with Life is Strange, and it. I think that they're they're at this point kind of doing a better job of like sustaining hype than even Telltale does in Absolutely. terms of like trickling it out. I know it pisses some people off, but it's sort of like, hey, uh, yeah, the first the first chunk of Final Fantasy VII. Like, you, maybe you know what happens, maybe you don't. I don't know, but, you know. And, and, and if that's not enough for you and you can't wait for Final Fantasy VII uh, and you've been looking for an eccentric, uh, heartfelt Japanese game that's been in development for centuries, Last Guardian's next week. Uh, I'm playing it now. Max, you're going to play it very soon. We're going to talk about it lots next in the show. Uh, next week, we can't say anything just yet. Yeah. But in the meantime, uh, 2017, looking awesome. 2016, we're going to look back. The Game Awards are tonight, hosted by Jeff Keighley. I'm very excited about this because it's the first 4K live stream that YouTube's ever done, uh, which, I mean, gaming just really helps propel that to the forefront. Um, it's going to be really cool. Uh, we've seen the nominees for a little bit, uh, a little while now. Yeah. We figured we'd go through them today and kind of give our quick picks on who we think is going to win. Use the hashtag up at noon. Let us know if we're right or wrong, uh, and uh, you can chime in. But, um, yeah, let's take a look at some of these nominees. You want to pull up the site? Yeah, I got it right here. Uh, we're doing a Let's Play of a website for those of you just tuning in. That's uh, right. Let's check out the big one. First of all, game of the year. Okay. Uh, here are the nominees. We got Doom, we got Inside, Overwatch, Titanfall 2, and Uncharted 4. Okay, I'll ask you real quick. Is your game of the year on this list? Because mine's not. Mine's no. probably Watch Dogs 2. Yeah, no. I like, loved uh, I loved Doom. I really liked Inside. Uh, Overwatch didn't grab me. Yeah. Titanfall 2 was pretty cool, but it didn't feel game of the year for me. And Uncharted 4 is a game that I thought was good, but not great. Yeah. If I had to pick something from this list, I'd probably go with Doom or Inside. What about you? Okay, I think personally Inside, in terms of just like obviously kicking the doors down, establishing a new thing, it's a new thing. I'm going to go with Overwatch. Yeah. Uh, I mean, this is Blizzard who historically haven't been a company that makes shooters, and they made a shooter that a lot of people fell in love with. Yep. It's weird, it's goofy, it's colorful, it's got a wonderful fan base that are really, really into having the characters all do sex stuff with each other. Yep. Uh, yeah, I think as far as like a kind of defining 2016 game, that's really it. Yeah, I'm, um, total, I'm totally down with that. I actually, I'm going to go right now, I'm going to say on record that tonight the winner will either be Uncharted 4 or Overwatch with a slight lead to Uncharted 4. I think Uncharted 4 is going to win tonight. Yeah, that makes sense. All, All right, right so, take a look at Best Studio Game Direction. Yeah, we got Blizzard, we got DICE, we got id, we got Naughty Dog, we've got Respawn. Uh, God, this is tough. Yeah. I love what DICE did with Battlefield 1, but... Even though I didn't really like the story or the gameplay as much in Uncharted 4, it's undeniable what Naughty Dog was able to achieve with that game. Just yeah. undeniable. Just in terms of graphics, in terms of scope, in terms of uh, mocap, animation, voice acting, character stuff, like, I think they win that. That, I was, that, that game do. is like quadruple A. Like, yeah. that is such a, a high quality game. Um, I'm going to go with Respawn. Okay. I'm going to go you with that. Respawn because they're a bunch of veterans. It's, it's kind of their, it's like, this is, this is what Titanfall 1 should have been. Yeah. Um, you know, I think there's that. It's not. It's not that you're. It's not. It's an unfinished game, but it's sort of like here's the here's the skeleton. Let's sure. let's put some meat on it after the fact. Uh, Titanfall 2's campaign wasn't like Game of the Year material, but it was like it was. It, it was, was cool. good. Also, I love the fact that they're like, hey, our our DLC is are, for the most part free. Like it's going to be like yeah. we want to support our community. Uh, I feel like they've been wonderfully transparent. 
Um, as far as a new studio goes, like this is their second game, and I think they really delivered on it. So, yeah. you know, good stuff. Best narrative. This one's so weird. This is where I love to see things get really complicated in terms of like, you have these very personal, intimate indie games, and you have these big, sprawling open world games, and you have stuff like Uncharted. Like the fact that Uncharted, which has like some of the most like known voice actors of all time, is going head to head with stuff like Oxenfree or Inside, which yeah. Inside doesn't have voice acting at all. It doesn't have dialogue, it doesn't no. have words. I'm gonna go with that. I think yeah. the best narrative, I think that uh, it's, like, I like I liked Firewatch a lot, but that could also just be a book on tape. Yeah, like, but I could, think, but yeah. if we're just judging narrative, like, then I'm, I'm going with Firewatch on this one. I thought that the opening section of Firewatch, which I think you really all should play, yeah. um, it's, it's a very sort of, like, sort of flimsy way to tell a story, because it's just almost just text on a screen. It looks like when you're waiting for a movie to start, but it's so haunting. It's about, a, like, a marriage that falls apart because yeah. of mental health issues, which sends the protagonist out into the woods to work this new job. He gets, like... Almost like catfish, but yeah, I'm not yeah. gonna say anymore. I, I'm, I'm a big fan of, of show don't tell as a storytelling thing, and yep. I think inside was literally just that, and yeah. there was not a single like you weren't pressing X to do a thing, you were just doing the thing. You were yeah. you were moving and and exploring that world, and it felt like felt similar to Limbo, but obviously like they kind of I think they they refined it. Okay, best uh, art direction. This is an easy one for me. Uncharted Four, obviously probably the best looking game. No, definitely the best looking game ever made. But Abzu was stunning. Abzu felt like like the best dream I've ever had. It was, you know, a reductive way of saying it was journey underwater yeah. uh, is one way of doing it. But this game was absolutely gorgeous and I think what was really cool about Abzu was it was almost non-threatening in the way you pl like traveled through this world. It's about three hours long. Mm -hmm. It's just consistently beautiful. Things cannot really kill you or attack you the whole time. It just feels like this awesome adventure. Uh, definitely check that out. It looks yeah. gorgeous on a really nice TV. I'm going to go with Firewatch because it feels like an, kind of an R-rated indie film made by Pixar. Uh, all right, best music and sound design. Uh, Doom, Inside, Battlefield 1, Res Infinite. This is tricky. I want to go with Thumper. Thumper, Thumper is, sure. uh, yeah, yeah, Thumper, hands down. Uh, yeah. That game, if you haven't played it, uh, put on some big headphones and mess around with that. That game is, people are like, oh, it's a rhythm game. Why isn't it more dancey? It's like, this is an abrasively, terrifyingly industrial game. Yeah, Thumper uh, felt like if, like, Trent Reznor tried to kick your ass in an alley. Yeah. Uh, on to best performance. I love that we're going from like we went from you know voice acting to motion capture, and now it's just performance yep. capture. Uh, who do we got? We got Alex Hernandez as Lincoln Clay. We got uh, Delilah and Firewatch. We got Elena and Uncharted Four. I'm actually going to uh, go with Sissy Jones as Delilah. I thought she was fantastic at this yeah. game. Um, she did that perfect thing. It felt like like talking on the phone with somebody you hadn't met before. Yeah. Like and trying to buy into everything and trying to sort of stay cautiously optimistic about who this person is. I'm going to go with Rich Summer in Firewatch. Okay. Uh, cuz he it really uh he, he felt almost like um almost like oh god what's his name? Um uh god Coach McGurk, uh Bob's Burgers, what's yep. his name? Uh John John oh god I'm drawing a blank. He just it's just kind of a relatable dude. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um anyway, uh games Eugene for Merman? impact uh what? Eugene Merman? No, 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 Bob and Bob's Burgers. That's the main dude. H. John, John Benjamin. Benjamin, that's the one. It, right. it reminded me of him for some reason. Uh, next one is Games for Impact Award. I actually didn't play a ton of these, which I feel really bad about. But yeah. um, the only one I did try was That Dragon Cancer, which uh, kind of hit me on a personal level. Uh, so I don't know. I'm, not, I'm actually not going to make a call on this one because I, wasn't, I, I haven't played enough. Uh, best indie game. Again, I don't even know what quantifies that, but Hyper Life Drifter, you played for a while, right? You got into that. Yeah. Um, Stardew Valley took over this office, as did The Witness. Mm -hmm. um, I'm gonna, probably going to go with Inside on this one. I think I liked Inside a little bit better than Firewatch. I'm going to go with Hyper Life Drifter. Okay. Uh, I think that was just, like, I didn't, I didn't finish it, but I, like, I loved that game, what I played of it. It's just, it's just beautiful. It was yeah. such, a, a, such a wonderful, like, love letter to games I grew up with. And it's like, you can just see all the influences and... It didn't feel like pandering at all. It felt like very much its own thing. Yep. Um, and it was also like they they came out and they made that game and they and they did it and like you know uh, as a you know Kickstarter baby that you know grew up. Totally. So. All right, let's let's uh, speed around through some of these best mobile handheld game. I don't care what else is on this list. It's Pokemon, Pokemon Go. Go. It's got to be Pokemon yeah. Go. This game took over the world. Yep. Like my parents called me about this game. Exactly. I know the gameplay wasn't fantastic, but the fact that it brought people together in real life is something that none of these games could do on that level. Yeah. Uh, best VR game. Job Simulator. Really? Job Simulator. Oh, man. I don't know. This Job is, Simulator. This is tough, dude. Job Simulator. Res Infinite is phenomenal. I don't care. Job Simulator. You didn't play most of these games. I played Res Infinite. Res Infinite is phenomenal. Batman VR is incredible. Like That's stand, actually... The... Standing in a mirror in that game is, yeah. is haunting. Wow. Um, best action game. Let's see. I'm going to go with... Oh, God, this is really I'm gonna tough. I'm going to go with Battlefield 1. I think I'm going to go with Doom on this one. Okay. Yeah. Doom yeah, is what, I, like, what the hell is an action game anyway? All games are. We do this actions. every year at IGN. Yeah, We're I like, what's it. an action game? Oh, what's here's an action best adventure? action slash adventure. Yep. Uh, 
Uh, honestly, Ratchet and Clank. I really liked Ratchet yeah, and Clank. It ditto. was really fun. It was really colorful. It was really cool to play like a, a 3D platformer that looked that gorgeous. It felt like what Nintendo should be doing if yep. they could get their ish together this year. No, I, I, I am with you on that one. Yep. Uh, uh, best role playing game: Witcher Three, Wild Hunt, Blood One. That's, really? Yep, yep. Yeah. Expansion pack. That game is that game is nuts. That's a, that's a full second like Witcher game. That is that, that is a an extra an entire sure. world to explore. I'll give you that. Yeah. Best fighting game. Street Fighter Five. Uh, Street Fighter Five. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, I feel bad that people didn't really get into this one. Pocket Tournament was a fun weekend. I played that for a little while, but it was a little too weird for me. Best family game. Um, Lego Force Awakens for yeah. sure. Okay. Pokemon Go was weird because like families had to warn their kids yeah. not to play it. In, Don't in walk on down by those train tracks. Yep. Uh, best strategy game. We're we're a couple of real big uh, hardcore strategy gamers. Uh, yeah, totally. Not. <laughs> nope. Skipping this one. Yep. Uh, best sports. Oh yeah, we love sports and racing. Skipping um, this one too. Yeah. Multiplayer. I go with sports because I like I like I like fast cars and music better than actual yeah. sports. I, I really want right. to play Overcooked with you, by the way. For we need to do that. So yeah, that's all the categories. Everything else is fans' choice. Yeah. Uh, let us know what you thought the game of the year was based on these, or if you have a different suggestion, use the hashtag Up at Noon. Uh, and we will we will read that on the show. Yeah. Uh, Bruce says, Watch Dogs 2 and Overwatch Game of the Year for me. Tons and tons of fun and both excellent games. Uh, and David Murray says, Wait, was Fallout last year? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, man. Yeah. yeah. That yeah. was uh, 1, 1, 11, 10, 01. One of the things you and something. I were talking about was Far Cry year, Primal. Yeah. That was this year. Uh, it's like, been a weird year. Yeah. Um, so one thing that's happening this year that we obviously are very excited about, you can tell by our robot dogs, is mm -hmm. Star Wars Rogue One, The Rogue's Awaken as it's called in my head, where I made up that sentence. I don't think so. um, it's doing really well. Um, I think a lot of people are sort of on the fence about how this is going to be received, and early pre-order stuff for tickets is kicking ass. Yeah. Uh, record breaking. Is it record breaking? Is it? Uh, yes, it okay. is. It is. Um, um, especially for like, uh, well, it's actually, it's, so the interesting thing that we're going to drill into right here is that Rogue One is smashing records for 2016. The one thing it can't beat in all of time is its older brother, Star yeah. Wars. Force Episode Awakens, seven. yeah. So, um, yeah, so we got, uh, for movie tickets, Rogue One's first 24 hours outstrips their sales for Suicide Squad, Deadpool, and Doctor Strange. Yeah, Deadline... Suck it, superheroes. Deadline put together a piece uh, that we're pulling a lot of these quotes from, so shout out to those guys. Um, yeah, obviously, phenomenal year for movies, uh, incredibly lucrative year for movies, incredibly lucrative year for Disney. Yeah. Uh, IMAX has reported that Rogue One is their second highest day of pre-sales, which means it ranks behind the 6.5 million tracked up by Force Awakens first 24-hour sales a yep. year ago. Uh, you know, Star Wars is a, is a, always been kind of almost a tech demo. Like it's been a sizzle reel of just here's the finest special effects in the in the yeah. universe right now. And IMAX is a great way to kind of demo that. So you know, I think with Rogue One as well. Like I mean, I think it's doing way better than I gave it credit for because I think I've still had to answer questions. I just did over Thanksgiving break of like, what is that movie? Yeah. Who's in that movie? When does it take place? Like, yeah. is the ball in it? They're still gonna see it. They'll figure it out. Yeah. Uh, meanwhile, over at Fandango, the company reports extraordinary demand for tickets to Rogue One, a Star Wars story. Within minutes of going on sale, we sold hundreds of thousands of tickets. Uh, yeah, I mean, we pre-ordered it, obviously, because we got brain problems, but, mm -hmm. like, you How know, was that process for you, by the way? Was it, like, because I noticed with, like, uh, the Alamo website that yeah. went down, uh, Movie Phone was cr crashed for a it's little bit. It's always a mess. Uh, I love that Alamo, for pre-ordering tickets on there, they put you in a queue with everyone else in the country for their entire chain, which I felt like maybe was sort of a bad setup. Uh, Interesting. Because basically it was like, hey, you're number 3,967. And I'm like, all right, so there's some other people in line here. This might take a second. Little, um, little cheat code for that stuff. If you're ever trying to buy tickets online for a movie that's like going to sell out within seconds, have your laptop open, but also have the mobile version open because mm -hmm. a lot less people check that. Yeah. It's a little more cumbersome to get your credit card stuff in there, but uh, you'll be able to check out while everything else is just loading up so for you. So we're, uh, we're seeing it not opening night because we got a holiday party, yes. except I'm actually seeing it opening night because a friend bought tickets for me. Mm -hmm. And because you so don't care about this company. I, yeah, I'm a real, I'm a real shill. Um, I like the Star Wars. Uh, but no, like, uh, I'm still going to go to the holiday party. I'm going to show, show up and be real excited and get drunk for free. It's going to be great. But no, like, we're seeing it, what, twice opening weekend? Friday night and Sunday yeah. morning. Yeah, yeah. it's going to be great. different theaters. It's Star Wars. It's yeah. awesome. Uh, anyway, uh, tracking has Rogue One opening between $100 million and $140 million stateside, which would make it the second best December debut after Force Awakens. It's pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. Uh, Finding Dory was Fandango's biggest animated preseller, and that went on to make $135 million, while Suicide Squad was the online ticket retailer's biggest August preseller with $133.7 million opening. Yeah. Uh, basically, what we're getting at here in news that should surprise no one is that a Star Wars movie will make a lot of money Dude, by people paying to go see it. I cannot believe that Disney paid $4 billion for Star Wars. And the amount of money they made back on that. That's like buying like Boardwalk and Park Place for like 50 bucks and then putting hotels on it. And yep. just running Monopoly. Pretty much. And uh, they're, uh, they're definitely not being shy about cashing in. Uh, I love that 
you know, you think like, oh yeah, going to see a movie, that's just, um, you know, you're going to see the movie. That's not like buying a thing, mm -hmm. but what if it was? And in some cases, it definitely is. It is. Um, we've got these dumbass goggles. Yeah, so we- Stupid, the, stupid goggles. Some of the theater exclusive stuff, so different things that you can walk away from the, from the theater with. Um, these, these movie tickets in the corner are really cool. They're like, you know, printed out and they're on heavy card stock. Uh, up in the upper left, obviously, you've got these funny 3D goggles stupid, you can wear. Stupid, stupid goggles. Uh, in the lower left, this is really cool. It's actually becoming sort of a tradition for us, is that uh, this, this uh, art site called Mondo makes pint glasses mm -hmm. for Star Wars movies. We have them from Force Awakens, and now we're going to pick them up on Sunday morning for the ones... Uh, for, it's gonna uh, be one. it's gonna be weird as hell. Uh, I don't know in a decade when if Disney's doing this every year and mm -hmm. I continue to have the same issue going to this every year, I'm gonna have like an entire cupboard full of Star Wars cups. Like that's gonna be all of it. That's my secret is like little by little, yeah. my wife's not gonna notice. I'm gonna start taking yeah. stuff out of the kitchen and replace it with Star Wars stuff. Yep. Um, so yeah, there we go. Star mm -hmm. Wars Force Awakens. We're very excited about that. Yeah. Um, we got something really really cool in the office. Um, we kind of we kind of talk smack on this. Uh, basically, in Rogue One, Star Wars story, there is a new robot dog. Yeah. His name is Attacked. You want to pull Attack up that box? Uh, yeah, it comes in a box which looks like this. This is the, um, this is the brand new Ad Act. It it's is huge. All-terrain armored Hold cargo on, I transport. Show you guys something. Yeah. So we kind of. Uh, Pipe down over there. Um, so we kind of talk some smack on this because basically, if you compare it to the original, uh, or not the original, but this is the 1997. Ooh, our dogs are. Yeah. Big. Oh my. Uh, yeah. This is the this is the one that came out when we were kids in grade school, and this is like this is pretty cool. It does like a bunch of stuff. You can make it move around. It still does sound effects and things. It doesn't walk on its own. There's no app to pair it with. Basically, what you do here is you get a Bluetooth thing and you can remote control it. And not only that, there's this whole augmented reality like director mode. Uh, but as far as being an actual out of the box toy on its own. It's kind of limited on paint ops. It only, it, I love this, it only seats one dude, mm -hmm. whereas this one fits two people in it. Yeah, uh, I, I but do But like meanwhile, that. it also does do uh, what do you, what happened? What's wrong? Is it, I don't know. I don't know what you did to it. You broke it already. Whoa! Um, yeah, it shoots, it shoots darts out of it, um, but you can, it's got this whole like weird little playset thing. Um, I think I was a little bit harsh on it at first in terms of it being like, what is, the, what is this toy? Okay. Good job. That happens in the movie, probably. Um, I mean, a lot of people, obviously, their first, like, the thing that inspires them to go on to be filmmakers is Star Wars. That's kind of how it's been yeah. for a generation. Like, you'd, you'd be hard-pressed hard, hard pressed to find a filmmaker who's not going to, like, be like, hey, that was an inspiration to me. A lot of kids, um, you know, would would make videos with their Star Wars toys in their backyard and stuff like that. I never actually did anything like that myself. Mm -hmm. um, but, I, you know, I played with Star Wars toys, and it's always been... <laughs> yeah, it's always been all about imagination. Um, what's nuts with this is that kids actually have, you know, you can make videos, you can make movies using your phone. A lot of kids are just doing, you know, leaving, you know, mean comments on our videos and stuff. But uh, this is a, a remote-controlled ATAT that has an app that lets you do filmmaking with it. Mm -hmm. It took like adult engineers in 19, the late 1970s to be like. How do we make a thing walk like it's in the movie, and now kids yeah. just go to the store and it just walks for you? So it's like kind of like, is this? Is this too obvious and too easy? Is this dumbed down, or is this one of those things that will inspire an entire new generation to do even weirder stuff? I think it's great. I mean, it, it, yeah. you can download a free app and basically put lasers and explosions all over the sky if that's what you want. Uh, this also turns into a zip line. Am I correct? I love this. This is like I, I really I just I like I like play sets. I, yeah. like, I like toys. Me too. Um, this is yeah, a great one. You get this cool. I love that the, all the boys go to the beach and they get all their stuff together and they're just like, hey, let's get all the brewskis. Let's get our uh, let's get our Bluetooth enabled droid. And he can play some. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Listen to some rap music. God, okay. this is actually yeah. really cool. I really We're like this. We're just dumb dudes. Man. Anyway, uh, yeah, Star Wars. Uh, so other stuff we got this week. I love that like, my week started, I got a piece of physical hate mail, but then I also got Star Wars toys in the mail, so it was kind of like, eh, that's Gee, okay. who wins? Yeah, life goes on. Yep. Um, this is something that's sort of ostentatious. Uh, <laughs> there is a st <laughs> Star Wars Black Series exclusive to Walmart, which mm -hmm. is the Scarif Trooper. Uh, he's been frozen in plexiglass here. They sent this like ridiculous window box. I'm opening this friggin' thing. Yeah. Get get out of there. Um, there's a collector crying right now. I'm not a like I'm not a big Walmart guy. There's actually there's not any in the uh, the big uh, uh, there's nothing in the Bay Area really that I can get to too easily. But mm -hmm. uh, currently, in terms of collector grade like small scale figures, Walmart has the exclusive on those. Yep. So if you're looking for like really articulated little guys that are, you know, nicely painted. Mm -hmm. That's the place to go. I actually uh, collect these uh, Black Series figures. I really, really like them. And the quality's all over the place. 
you were mentioning that you think they're starting to get a little bit better. This is the first one that I've been like, oh, this looks really awesome, pretty yeah. much since Force Awakens. Basically, this is the uh, this is the Scarif Trooper. He's a little beach boy. Um, he's like, oh, hey, what are you doing there? Get, get, move along. Get out of here. Um, he's yelling at Freddie Mercury and yeah, the Predator. Yeah, get out of there, boys. Not, no time for this. Uh, I really I really like this design. He kind of looks like a... It kind of looks like an ice cream. I don't know. The, the other one has like the blue stripe. It's like yep. all very festive. Um, and it got me thinking like, what's the best? What's the best trooper? There's so many. There's so many troopers in Star Wars, and we're getting new ones. We're obviously we're getting the shore trooper or scarif trooper, as he's more commonly known. Um, but like, which is the, which is your favorite? Uh, I can tell you right off the bat what my least favorite is. I'm not a big fan of the clone troopers. Fair enough. Never was. I, I mean, I'm not really crazy about the different rainbow colors yeah. that come in. Just the design. They just kind of look like weird, like 90s, fo like yeah. extreme football game. I kind of see of that. Yeah, they look they're very Dreamcast. Yeah. Um, but yeah, let's go through all the different troopers. Obviously, there's a bunch of little kind of little itty bitty variations. First and foremost, there's the stormtroopers, the yeah. Imperial basic stormtroopers. These guys are so iconic. They're the best. I, I don't know. I, I think it's hard to top these. They look like weird space skulls. They look like skeletons. That's awesome. Yeah, these are really cool. They're terrifying. Yeah. Uh, their armor doesn't actually do anything because that's why they always get killed. Yeah. But that's okay. It's cute. And they, they die together like friends. Yeah, and then of course you also get the sand troopers, which are like, I like them better than regular stormtroopers because they're basically like, hey guys, let's go camping, but also let's ride some dinosaurs while we're at it. You know why I like sand troopers? Because I have the idea of them coming back to the Death Star covered in filth and seeing the stormtroopers and being like, oh, how was your day? Easy. Yeah. Fine. Yeah, I was out there riding a, a damn, like, rhino turd-dropping dinosaur boy. Yeah. I like the idea that they show up and they're just filthy and they're getting their tracking footprints everywhere and they got a bunch of mouse droids going behind them and trying yep. to clean up, a bunch of Roombas. Uh, then, of course, there's snow troopers who, I, like, let's be honest, they look like Klansmen. Like, <laughs> they're just scary looking. Yeah. And they're, and they're, all, they're all toasty. They're all yeah, warm they're, they're and they're nightmare warm boys. Um, I don't know. I like, I like uh, snow troopers a bit. I just I think it's kind of one of those things where you could be like, oh, this is probably adapts to all sorts of environments, but we know them as snow troopers. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, there's scout troopers who I are love these. They're so cool. They look like highway cops. Or like the scream killer. <laughs> yeah, that too. Yeah, they're just they're just like they're just such a good design. They also this looks like if you had to wear the armor, probably the most comfortable. Yeah, I, next I'm, to beach trooper here. I also really like hearing the troopers talk and the way yeah. like, it echoes through their masks. Hey, there's one of those damn bears again. Let's go shoot it with our gun. The tracks go off in this direction. Yeah. Uh, then of course there's the clone troopers. Man, like you know, <sighs> prequels. We're not fans of them that much. Obviously, they have their redeeming factors. I yeah. would say that the CG in Episode Two is is if you had to make a big damning broad stroke assessment, it's probably the worst thing in the entire series. Yeah. Uh, and you know they were pushing the pushing the boundaries. I think I think the, the uh, Attack of the Clones was actually the first feature film to be shot entirely digitally, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. So like they were trying new things, and I you know give them credit for that. But like the clone troopers, their design is just so it's so dorky. I don't like their frowns. Like it looks like when when a kid draw, draws eyebrows on somebody to make them look mean. Like, like dude, they're just even, like I'm yeah. sorry. Even when I was like in high school and I was incredibly excited for this, and I was like this is gonna be great. They're gonna talk about Boba Fett's origin story, and then I saw these guys, and I was like I don't know how I feel. Their faces look like buttholes. Yeah. They did do a good job. They did like the arc troopers and there's all the variations you see in Revenge of the Sith which we won't go yeah. into because there's too many of them. Um, but then of course we get new ones in Rogue One. We get the death troopers. I warmed up to these guys real quick. Yeah, uh, I did not like them at first because they, they look like hound dogs. Like they're just a little long in the face like an old horse. Yeah, they look kind of funny. But uh, I'm, I'm totally into them now and they're going to look awesome like surrounded by explosions and yeah. like the, the, the sort of green areas like this look really cool. I think just running around the Death Star, I'm like, whatever about them. Yeah. But seeing them, like, out in the wild, there's something menacing and terrifying Yeah, I'm excited them. to see what these guys do. Uh, then, of course, there's, yeah, these guys. I got to see this armor up close at, uh, I think, Comic-Con or Celebration or whatever the hell yeah. I went to this year. I can't even keep track. I just... I just like them. Also, I love that Donnie Yen actually leaked these early, and we mm -hmm. were like, "What the hell is that beige one?" Like, it was oh, the helmet, the right? being black or white, but the yeah. fact that they got some gray, sandy stuff makes a lot of sense. Yeah, and that's also like the the different rank that these guys have gives them different sort of like stripes and paint yeah. and stuff like that. Like some of them, you see like the general ones have blue, and yeah, they're really cool. I got an argument with uh, with my, my fiance about why they don't they don't have leg armor, and I was like, "Oh no, see, it's a tactical advantage because maybe they want to like get down on one knee and you get your shins covering it up, and mm -hmm. it's it's like," and she's like, "That doesn't make any sense," and I'm like, "Look, it's probably." An uncomfortable or shin armor, okay? Just another another main reason is that it's fake. Yeah, it's also not real. It's There's not a, real. a spaceman it's, at the beach. Yeah. Um, also, I totally forgot the flame trooper from Force Awakens. They always have those kind of those weird Actually, redesigns. For, I really like those. For New Order. Yeah. Um, I love that they're kind of going down a checklist of what we haven't seen. Mm -hmm. And the fact that they're like, hey, Star Wars has never gone to the beach. 
let's make a stormtrooper for the beach. And I'm like, I'm gonna go to the beach next summer and be like, look at me, I'm on Scarif. <laughs> Whereas I used to have to face One Direction and be like, look at me, I'm on Tatooine. <laughs> you know, because there's no ocean on Tatooine. That's true. Anyway, uh, we also got uh, the Funko uh, Smuggler's Bounty Box. We did, the Rogue One fun does not end here. We've got more yeah. and more presents to open up on this very tangible show where adults who dress like bullies play with toys. We really <laughs> do dress like bullies, it's pretty stupid. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, if you're unfamiliar, uh, Funko, uh, almost knocked over my at at. Um, Funko, you know, they do a, a you know subscription box service where you can get um, you know Star Wars stuff. They do the DC one and Marvel one as well. Uh, what are you doing? Get out of there! <laughs> get the hell out of here, guys! Our box came with a free Zach Ryan producer. Yeah, uh, he hears the word Funko and he just gets real excited. Uh, this comes with you got a nice pin of uh, K2SO, mm -hmm. uh, funny little boy. And then I, I feel like of all the weird stuff in Rogue One, like you know, all, you know, no, no, like disrespect to Cassie and Andor, but like. It just looks like Bob Villa. Like yeah. it's just like it's like hey, you you know you probably want to get a, a a patch of your friend's dad on a skiing trip. Yeah. Okay. Nice work. Uh, this old house. Yeah. Let's get to the good stuff here. Uh, here we go. We got a nice Jin Urso Funko Pop. Uh, that little one right there. You want to open that up for me? Yeah. Let's do it. Here we go. Here's the stuff we want to look at. We got a nice Imperial Death Trooper. Um, so uh, yeah, this is a fun thing that they totally do in the movie. Is they show up and they're like, they're like, ooh, 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 ooh. ooh. Uh, so I really, really love this design. It's very evocative of like uh, Leia in Return of the Jedi. Yep. Um, just really cool. You got this rebel helmet and these little bobbleheads are wonderful. Check this out. It's oh, a. Oh, she's uh, shaking. Oh boy. She looks like she's got a poop. Hey, knock it off, you two. And then we got this. Uh, this is what a Hikari Hikari minis. This is sort of like the Japanese vinyl inspired thing. It's a nice uh, raspberry Darth Vader. Look at that. That's totally what it looks like in Rogue One. Who's mad about that? Are you mad about it? I yeah. hope not. Uh, they also give you sort of ideas of how they made these things, prototypes and stuff like that. So yeah. you get to see them unpainted. You get to see the sort of design behind them. And yeah. then there's a t-shirt, right, Max? Yeah, we got a nice shirt for wearing. You know, you can wear it or you can just, I don't know what else you do with a shirt. You can hang out. Yeah. Make a little tiny tent for your pets. That is adorable. Yeah, look at those little baby boys. So yeah, anyway. that is the uh, Smuggler's Bounty for Rogue One. Uh, I think they put the Star Wars box out, what, every other month? Yeah, it's something it's like, like that. And they tell you the theme ahead of time, so yeah. if it's like a Jar Jar Binks box and you want to cancel ASAP, you can totally do that. So mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Uh, we talk about a lot of great stuff here, a lot of really good things, positive stuff, uh, but sometimes video games come out that are complete and utter baloney. We played one called Crystal Rift that's just... Uh, God, this is so fun. Let's take a look. Hey everyone, it's Brian and Max, and today we're, we're playing pl Brutal Pause no, of Fury not. for the Sega Genesis. Stop it. <laughs> we're playing Crystal Rift, which just launched on PS4 and PSVR. I don't know a lot about this game. It's a first-person dungeon crawler. Uh, I used to like games like this back in the day. Uh, we oh are already stuck. How do we get the puzzle? How do we get out? I was hoping we could see some ghouls and goblins and mummies of sorts. Yeah, I'm do you have any for, buttons that I'm you can use? I'm pushing a bunch of different ones. Apparently you just hump the throbbing walls. Okay. But they could have called that. All right, All right so there's well, a secret over here. Ooh. It's not giving me any button cues. Well, there's another way to go around there. Uh, so the movement in this game, journey begins with a single sidestep. Oh, sidestep. There we go. Oh, is this a tutorial? Yeah. The so tu this is one of those games where I feel like in VR might be a little interesting. Uh, in not VR, ooh. All right. This is this is uh, this is rough. <laughs> I was hoping we could see some sort of like ghouls or some old haunts. I think we're gonna see some ghouls. Oh, uh, what? Um, what do you mean tread carefully? How did Why you die? I don't know. I just I don't understand that at all. What? Okay. Here. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. That's really bad. Didn't you walk across it now? Also, what was that noise? Enter, Enter stranger. stranger. Okay, I get a sword. Oh, we got a sword. Oh boy, this is old, old times. Yeah, this is what video games were like for a lot of yeah. people back in the in the day on the what PCs. Does it say? There's a secret message up there. What's it say? Holding cells. Okay. Oh, that's a this is probably way better in VR, but also probably still not. Yeah, that great. I don't I think don't know. it's going to be very good. Why is it, it's my controller is constantly vibrating too. By the way, <laughs> really? like, yeah, it's just like everything vibrates. It's kind of startling. Okay. Do you think there's little rascals running around in here that no. come out of that grate? I don't think so. I think you should kill those buckets. Big buckets. Attention. Attention. It is forbidden to discuss or otherwise notice spatial abnormality caused by proximity to the rift. Prisoners are not to be allowed in prox. Okay. What are you talking about? The rift, probably. Get it together. 
Man. Uh, is this the Crystal Rift? This is like clip art, the game. Yeah, it really is. Okay, I got to open the door. There we go. With that special handle. It's always a good place to keep the, the door. What do you think's up here? I don't know. We can't look up, so. Nope. No, no one, one knows. Will, no one will ever know. Ah, holding block B. Hey, that's strange. It was actually. Sur oh. Oh. Oh, skeleton! Da, 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 da. All right. Ah. What? <laughs> 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 Do I like? I think you should kill him. Kill him. Oh, holy crap! Wow, what a game! Oh man, this is real, real rough. Oh, look, <laughs> somebody did it. Somebody did a nice, did a nice, a nice whiz. Re-secret rooms, they do not exist. I have a feeling they do. What is it doing? Uh, oh, look at that. Are you hearing that noise? Because it sounds like yeah. just... This is oh, There's some terrible. skulls on the wall. Oh, don't look at it too closely. It might turn around <laughs> sideways and become spooky. This is awesome. Oh, my God. Oh, I want to see this. is a Max Scoville last game right I here. I want to see this in VR. What is it? Crystal Rift. Ah, welcome back to, Wel <laughs> welcome back to the Crystal Rift, Hi, everybody. everyone. It's me, Crystal Rift. I've been an adult entertainer for 14 years now. <laughs> I started in my 20s. Now today I'm 70. Today we're doing a 70-minute special all about my feet. <laughs> <laughs> so don't forget to like, share, and subscribe, and tip the cams. How do you get through the... Where's the Rift? I think we're in it. Hold on, go right. I think there was a. There's a, no. There we go. You can open that door. I want to fight more ghouls and goblins. I would like to see one of the mummies. <laughs> Found oh. more secret rooms. Oh, look at this! Ah, the oh, special there skull. There is Drooly Skull. He's eating chocolates. <laughs> what? 133 a whole skulls over. O M M G. Over 130 <laughs> skulls to collect. Great. <laughs> Thanks. Very That's, helpful. That sounds fun. Who, man? Do you think anyone on Earth besides the guy who made this game collected all of them? Oh, I thought that was like a witch's hat. Brian, look out! It's a piss skeleton. <laughs> <laughs> he was doing farts. <laughs> he climbed out of a <laughs> fart on the ground. I'm oh, he already forgot about you. Go all kill right. him. Kill him. Kill okay. His butt. What an idiot! Great AI. Get him. This is like Spirit Halloween Store, the game. <laughs> uh, it sort of vibrates when I walk over the skeleton. Ah, really? Oh, the key. The key. <laughs> made of delicious Brax butterscotch candies. <laughs> oh, man, this oh, is wow. rough. I like, I like bad games. Yeah, oh, we already went here. <laughs> I like that I'm just like playing as a crab and I can just like walk sideways. <laughs> You're like, who did bad stuff to my wall? Where's the door? I don't even see it. We haven't even seen a door that needs a key, have we? Probably not. Is there a map? What? Do we go in here? Maybe. Yeah, try it. Just see if you die. No. I like how when you, you swipe, your your sword just goes through the damn wall. Oh, is this the, is this there oh, it is. the special the key? key door. We're in the key zone. Uh-oh, I don't like that noise. There's a spooky noise. Shh, hold on. Be very quiet. It's a monster man. <laughs> Shut up. It's too, too scary. Ooh, oh, spooky bats. Hello. It's oh, the witch is called during. <laughs> <laughs> ah, decorative hanging urns. Can you just get through it? What? Damn no. It. I just like looking at all the urns. <laughs> it's, all, it's only one urn. They just keep There were two of them. Oh. oh, more books. Prisoner tests are voluntary. Any prisoner unwilling to partake will be beat, and beatings are mandatory. Also, please do not feed the gruel. Oh, there's going to be a gruel and more PS. Somebody keeps dumping stuff on these stones. Don't like it. Whoa. Oh. Man, this is a, I just want to keep playing this game forever. Please wait. Loading. I might have to. So what I was I was kind of giving it the benefit of the doubt early on when I was like, yep. oh, it's probably procedurally generated. What the hell is going on? <laughs> <laughs> Wait, really? Save your soul. Okay. Oh, you oh can save. Oh, my God. I love bad games. Man. I'm so happy that consoles are finally getting the kind of trash that's been on PC forever. Yeah, it's really good. I've seen things, horrible things. All right. Let's, let's see if we can find what's one in more these, bad What's guy. in these old buckets? Bunch of dust? Yeah, Great. just a bunch of trash. Good to collect. Good to collect all the okay, buckets. Okay, hold on. And there's dust. that. There's that door. Level two tomb of the womb. The very spooky tomb. A spooky <laughs> a room full of phantasms. Here we go. Oh, 
<gasps> oh, no, it's a skeleton. A piss boy. <laughs> he's angry because he just went from the piss naps. And he's full of goo. Ah, Killer Instinct's spinal. Finally here <laughs> once again. <laughs> Get out of oh, the way. Oh, look at that. Oh, it's the blood shower. Go in there. Can you go in the blood ravine? I can go probably in there. Yeah, go in there. See what happens. Hold on. Hey. Isn't that, that sound oh. design? Oh, and then there's the fire hole. <laughs> Well, ladies and gentlemen, this is Crystal Rift. It's going to be hard to, make, to get Max to stop playing this game. Leaked! Elder Scrolls Six: <laughs> Skyrim 2. Uh, Dovahkin is back, and he's in the... Oh! The, the, <laughs> hell, the hell was that? Oh, it's so spooky! Ladies and gentlemen, we are now leaving the Crystal Rift. It was going up. Thank you for joining Max and I. So Crystal Rift is available for $6.39 if you're a PlayStation Plus subscriber. I think it might even be more than that. Who knows? It doesn't it, matter. Yeah. You're not going to buy it. No, you're not. I hope not. Or if you, you know, you could also go and have a big, big chicken sandwich. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for watching the Crystal Rift. Oh, boy. I like video games. I am... Super excited to try that game in VR. Oh, that's gonna be real weird. That'll be a good time. Um, that was a, that was a very fun video we, we put together right there. Max yeah. and I. That's really to give you like an idea how the sausage is made. We kind of go into the PlayStation Store every week because we're PlayStation guys. Sorry, no bias there. And we try to find like some of the weirder, stranger, not as great looking games. Um, and then we also play your Titan Falls and Battlefields and stuff like that. But uh, yeah, yeah, it's fun to look around the store and just see what what actually makes it through there because it's it's always kind of amazing. Like that damn mayonnaise game. That mayonnaise game was a weird game. That mayonnaise uh, game. Mayonnaise game. So, uh, Kickstarter is the thing that we've come to accept as part of our daily life and that it is a, a weird thing that occasionally stuff pops up there. Mm -hmm. uh, apparently, uh, a thing has been happening where people are putting up Kickstarters for like physical, thing, physical items, inventions, contraptions, yep. whatever, and Chinese knockoffs are being manufactured, designed, hitting market before the Kickstarter is even funded. Yeah, that's right. Uh, this website called Quartz, uh, it's QZ.com, put together this awesome thing with the headline, your brilliant Kickstarter idea could be on sale in China before you've even finished funding it. Um, so Chinese inventors are basically shopping on Kickstarter and trolling it for ideas and pulling stuff up. Uh, we found this one thing, or they did here, Quartz did, called the stick box. Yeah. Now the stick box was invented uh, as basically a sort of selfie stick sl uh, slash stand slash oh, a bunch yeah. of other things. It's a so transforming iPhone case, right? It's really smart. And then it's, uh, you know, it's out there in the wild already. Yeah. So, so this uh, this actually came together before this guy could even finish funding it. Obviously, his name's um, Yekatuil Sherman. Had been working on this for a very long time, was ready to get it out there <sighs> at the sort of finish line of getting it funded. And he went on a site and saw it was already going for a fraction of the price. Some of these are going for $12.99, some for $15.48. They're also going for like $10. His was like $43. And uh, if you're sitting there and you want something, and you're waiting for it to be funded, you're now sort of stuck with this weird situation where you go, well, do I want to pay the original artist who made this thing and spend $43 on it, or do I just want to go to China and, and yeah. you know, spend 10 I mean, bucks on thankfully, it? Thankfully, a lot of Kickstarter kind of crowdfunding culture is people supporting things that they believe in. It's, yeah. it's got a kind of almost a, it's got a kind of culture around it as yeah. opposed to just being a, a, a place to buy a thing. Uh, you know, people get excited about like, oh, I helped make this thing happen. I, you know, backed a Pebble watch or a Pezenzel or a terrible podcast. Um, you know, but uh, yeah, he said, you know, the other selfie st stick cases, but we are the only ones that have been copied. So it shows that our product is worth being copied. You know, imitation is the best form of, sincerest form of flattery. Yeah, um, I, I do like that quote. And I think it's like, he's right. Like, I mean, bad ideas don't really get ripped off, right? And it's like, even when you look on the iPhone store, most of the games you see there are clones or derivatives of other games that are actually clones of, or derivatives of games that we've been playing on consoles for a long time. So it's in a weird predicament, right? Because it's like, if you think about it, like, you know, if you're gonna buy like a handbag or an iPhone case, mm -hmm. um, like, hand, like a really nice expensive designer handbag could cost you $1,000, $2,000, $5,000, $10,000, or you can go to Chinatown and buy a bootleg version sure. for like a couple hundred bucks, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Or like, even less than that. Yeah, I'm actually, uh, this is a bootleg Levi's jacket. Really? Like, I totally got this in Vietnam at this place called like 
a, it's called like True Blue or something, or like Blue Denim, and it's, I don't think it's even actually a denim jacket, mm -hmm. it just looks like it, it's some weird kind of half denim fabric. And it's like, um, in, in other countries, that's sort of just more acceptable culturally, right? I think so. Like, it's you actually know? a rat race to sort of see who can make the best version of a knockoff thing, because that yeah. version wins. So there's almost an inventiveness in its own, there is actually the competition of, of engineering and tangible goods. Yeah, and I mean, you reach that point where like, obviously, you want to get the, you want to get the legit actual thing, but, you know, for certain stuff, it's like, what are you paying for? Like, what's the money going to? Uh, one thing that's really interesting is uh, Lego is famous for basically never putting their stuff on sale. Like, yeah. Legos are, they maintain a certain price point, and they're, you know, they're expensive. Like, they're an expensive, you know, uh, toy, and I think they, they control their own value. Nintendo's kind of the same way, where they're like, hey, this game that we put out in 1985, uh, it's out on our newest console. Uh, it's not 99 cents. Yeah. You know, you got to pay. They rarely do price drops. They've, yeah. they've outspokenly said, like, you know, we want to keep this sort of level of prestige. And yeah, they are making bootleg Legos now. And yeah. I saw one thing that people were actually kind of like upset about because it's it's kind of destroying the collector's market in a lot of ways. Uh, but in other ways, they put handles on the boxes, which Lego themselves don't do. Yeah. So if you're looking for like the original Death Star, which goes for, or the Millennium Falcon, which goes for, I think, like three or $4,000 now, maybe even more than yeah. that. Um, you might just buy the bootleg version. I was at CES last year covering it for IGN, which is the big sort of com computer electronics show, consumer electronics show in Vegas. Just massive halls of uh, tech and weird, like just bizarre like mirrors that make you look prettier and stuff like that. And the deeper into the pockets you go of that place, the weirder it gets. And in one point, uh, feds actually raided it and busted a bunch of guys who were selling bootleg versions of hoverboards. I think the Fed just wanted hoverboards. I think so too. Yeah. Right next to the people who are actually selling those hoverboards legitimately. Yeah. The weird thing is at CES, you actually can't sell stuff there. It's not like really like a mall. Yeah. Uh, so they got busted for that. So this is never going away. It's actually, uh, with 3D printing, it's becoming more and more apparent that this is something we're gonna have to compete with. So keep in mind, your next big Kickstarter idea might get ripped off before you even get it out there. Yeah, so the good the thing is to start up a bootleg company. That's yep. the real trick there. Uh, um, in, in other dystopian uh, world news, yeah. we got a fun little tidbit. Uh, Max, you and I have been playing a lot of Watch Dogs mm -hmm. uh, for a lot of reasons. One, hacking is fun and it's cool. Sure. And two, it takes place in San Francisco, which is a city we live in. Yeah. Um, and I think it's just a bright, colorful playground. And there's something about the tone of that game that's really cool. It's Marcus and his friends you know? are, yeah, mischievous. Yeah. Um, They're out there wreaking havoc. What's funny is in that game, you can hack pretty much everything. Like, there's, you can't hack the dogs. That's like one of the few things. The other thing you can't hack is the San Francisco Muni trains. Mm -hmm. I think the buses you can, like, you can still get on them and interact with them, but you can't, like, make them explode for no reason yeah. or do flips or whatever. Um, that is a thing you can hack in real life, though, apparently. Uh, this wonderful thing broke. Uh, this could almost be a marketing stunt. It's not. Uh, somebody hacked the Muni Transit system. Yeah. Uh, there's this whole system. It's like a, a lot of cities have it where it's basically an RFID chip. It's a clipper card. You know, you tag your thing, and it uh, lets you on the, the train, and mm -hmm. that's how you pay your fare. It's no tickets or coins or whatever. Um, Somebody hacked it so that I guess it was just free? It was free for all of Saturday. Their, their computer impairments were down. All the Muni stations have these, like, uh, camera or these screens outside of them, and these said, you hacked. Yeah. Like, they didn't even write your hack. Dead or, Yeah. Um, so, yeah, Ubisoft actually said, like, <laughs> Marcus and DeadSec had yeah. nothing to do with this. This is not viral marketing. One of the weird things is that the hacker behind this put up his email address and was just like, if you want this fixed, you got to send me bitcoins. And another hacker hacked him using that email address. So this yeah. is where we're heading as a world. That's yeah. fun. Emergent multiplayer. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, that's just, I, you can't even, you can't make that up. Mm -hmm. That's just nuts. That's bonkers. So yeah. It's also, like, I love that, like, San Francisco is one of the most techie cities in the world. So if you're going to be, like, a hacker supervillain, like, Go somewhere in the sticks, you know? Go someplace where they gotta call up their grandson to come do the tech support. But here it's like... Also, like, I ride the Muni every day. It kinda sucks. Like, if it didn't work for a whole day, I'd be like, oh, that's normal. Like, yeah. that's not even hacking to me. That's just Tuesday. Yeah, pretty much. Uh, yeah, so, uh, moving on. Uh, one thing that I'm a big fan of, uh, there's a line of action figures called SH Fig Arts. Uh, they're made by, uh, what are they? I don't know who the hell makes them. But they're, uh, they're released in the stateside by this company called Bluefin. Mm -hmm. uh, Tamashi Nations. They got, like, eight names. I don't know why they call them that. They are, uh, they usually run about, um, I don't know, 50, 50, 60 bucks, depending on what you're buying. Yeah. Uh, some of them are, some of the licenses are available stateside officially. Uh, there are Star Wars ones. I got Freddie Mercury. The Dragon Ball ones are fantastic. I have a Piccolo yeah. and an Android 16 and a Trunks. Uh, they just announced, finally, that they are doing Street Fighter ones, and they are gorgeous. Wow. So if you're a fan of... Uh, Street Fighter action figures, or Street Fighter or action figures, or any of the above. Uh, mm -hmm. Take a look at these. They got obviously two classics, Ryu and Chun Li. Uh, just gorgeously posable. 
Uh, I remember kind of initially having sort of a sticker shock at the price of these, but getting mm -hmm. my hands on one, like, they're, you get what you pay for. Like, they're still toys. They're still a waste of money. Like, yeah. it's obviously, it's, if, if it's a matter of, you know, so, eating for a week or buying a toy, then that's well, a no-brainer. Yeah, but. definitely. But, not, like, to put it this way, like, you know, I bought the Luke Skywalker one. By, by the way, that chun is really cool. I bought the Luke Skywalker Black Series figure, right? And it comes with this, like, soft goods robe that looks really cheap. He looks like a Ken doll with just, like, an old, like a yep. 4XL shirt but on But it's him. cool because you can take his shirt off and make him do weird stuff that's with Obi-Wan Kenobi. He does, like, hunky, handsome Luke stuff. Yeah. But then this one, on the other hand, really cool, much more poseable. Uh, he comes with uh, his sort of, like, force training helmet and everything like that. Um, just lots of really cool stuff about it. Yeah. And the other cool thing is that a lot of their accessories are sort of interchangeable. Mm -hmm. So you, you can, can make their they have weird hands and stuff. Yep. Uh, I put some of the Dragon Ball Z hands on uh, on Freddie Mercury, and that doesn't look right because they're big cartoony hands that are the wrong skin tone. So mm -hmm. he's got these like giant mitts, sort of like sort of like that. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, the Chun Li and Ryu ones. Uh, if you want to take a look at these, they're using a new body type that apparently allows for more more posability. Uh, that one on the right there is just a really dumb picture, but you get the idea that they're going yeah, for. Yeah, so I was uh, reading up on with, this, by the way. Things. They have like a sort of like skeletal system that almost clicks in the way that they tried. I don't know if you've ever seen those like old Jack specific uh, WWE figures that are like rubbery but have like a clickable part inside. Yeah, them. yeah. So it's sort of like that, and they were showing this off at a Japanese trade show recently for these like weird just wireframe versions of characters they made. And you'll be able to pose them a lot easier because they actually have like sort of like a skeleton inside them. Yeah. I think that's awesome. Um, and this is really cool too, the sort of like Blaster stuff they do. Yeah, the, uh, they make uh, they make generic like battle damage. Like yep. I, they make like craters that you can put your dudes in, or just like explosions around them, so you can make it so that it's like Goku's charging up or Freddie Mercury's farting or whatever. Um, yeah, these are running you about fifty five bucks. Uh, they're out April twenty seventeen uh, at New York Comic Con. I got to look at some prototypes they have in the works. They've got uh, Dota two figures. They've got uh, Atlas and Peabody from Portal two. Yep. They've got I think. Uh, God, are those, are those figmas or I think those I think those are fig arts. I don't know. I can't even tr keep track. But if you're if you're looking for a, a good action figure line to get in on, check out fig arts because they're gorgeous. Yeah, they it's just a, a really job. awesome time for action figures. Um, this week we finally heard the silence unbroken from uh, Hello Games, creators of No Man's Sky. They put out the new Founders Pack update, which shows basically where this game can go from here. Uh, it was cool to hear from them. I know that like just that entire situation was sort of a train wreck. Uh, the game came out, people tried to sue them for uh, saying that it didn't do what it was supposed to do. People actually tried to get their money back and successfully did. Uh, and we kind of heard some stuff from Sean from Hello Games being like, this has been hard for us and horrible, and then they went radio silent, did that weird tweet thing. In the meantime, we just got a book this week called Limitless Sky. It's completely unofficial, so they haven't totally broken their silence yet. But this is sort of like a half guide of No Man's Sky, slash just sort of like a really cool visual kind of dictionary of how things work in this game. Uh, it gives you a little sort of rundown at the beginning of what Hello Games has been working on for the years before this. Obviously, we've got stuff like Joe Danger, which is always cool to see like a, a brief history of this stuff. Uh, and it actually gets footnoted at the very end with games that you can play if you also like uh, No Man's Sky, uh, stuff like Elite Dangerous and Star Citizen. So this is a cool book. Um, Max, you and I were kind of worried about like how does a book work for a game that's procedurally yeah, how generated? Do you, how do you make a book about a game that's different for everybody? Yeah, uh, I mean it's interesting. I like I like that it, it is sort of breaking down. It's almost like the fact that this is a fixed known quantity as a book. Uh, it's kind of cool because the game is constantly sort of shifting and changing in itself. Yeah. I like uh, the idea of like here's here's pictures of animals you'll never meet. Yeah, you never get this, to. Thankfully, you never get to meet those awful things. Like it kind of makes me want just like a a book of all the different creatures in No Man's Sky, sort of like an encyclopedia of just you know bizarre animals. Yeah. So like obviously there are some constants in the game, like your exo suit and your your inventory slots, the sort of items and stuff you can get in the game. So it does work sort of as a guide, but there is a lot of cool stuff in here that like. It's just cool to see stuff in a procedurally generated game printed in something that will last forever. Yeah, you know. Yeah, it's a it's a nice thing that you might, you know, find in the back so of a back of a weird bookstore in twenty one? years. Yeah, so this is fifteen ninety five. It's out from Triumph Books. Uh, yeah, Limitless Guy. Go check that out. Max, we only have a few minutes left. We don't really have a ton of stuff to go through, but I wanted to talk about something real quick with you. You and I are like, kind of like vaguely connected to the sort of fandom around Power Rangers. We grew up around it. We like it. I think I'm more of a Ninja Turtles dude. I've never been totally married to Power Rangers as a series. That being said, when you make a movie about something, you kind of hope that you get everything right. Uh, IGN got an exclusive look this week at Alpha from Power Rangers. Um, we're a little worried. I'll be totally honest. Let's yeah, not to look a gift horse <laughs> in the mouth, but uh, this horse got some weird teeth. Yeah. Here's, here's what Alpha looks like. Uh, uh, 
What? Uh... So, yeah, obviously on the right, some of the older designs, which I really love, uh, very funky 80s, 90s sort yeah. of like Toys R Us robot type Just of thing. C-3PO rip off to the extreme. Yeah, but uh... on the left, the new one, um, what? what happened? Like, he has a UFO on his head. Like, I just feel uncomfortable, and maybe that's the idea. Why are his arms so big? Yeah. His eyes are really weird. He's got this, like, sort of pregnant belly he's walking hey, this around This looks with. like something from, like, I don't know, like a, a video game that would get canceled in 2003. You the know? headlights are weird. I don't know how I like, feel it looks about like, that. I, I don't know if you ever saw the old 80s movies, Battery Not Included. Battery's Not Included, but he looks like that. Um, Bill Hader's voicing this guy, so maybe they'll really play into huh. how stupid and goofy the character I, model looks. I have, like... I have guarded expectations for this movie. Yeah. My biggest fear about the Power Rangers movie is that it's not good or bad. I think mediocrity is this movie's biggest enemy. Like, if it is if it is a colossally stupid, terrible mess of a movie, that'll be funny. Yeah. Uh, but I mean, there's a lot of good people attached to it. We've got Rita Repulsa here. Obviously, she doesn't really look like Rita Repulsa. She looks kind of like a sexy green goblin. Yeah. But maybe the reason she's green is she's going to make the green Power Ranger out of herself. I don't know. Kind of hope, hope for so. that. Uh, and then the Megazord, obviously the first look at this should not be through a toy, but it here is. it is. It is very uncomfortable. Yeah. It sort so of looks... We're a little worried about this. Cautiously optimistic. I think it's going to deliver, but the art direction is a little weird so far. Anyway, that's up at noon. I'm Brian. This is Max. We did it. Another successful week in the books. Thank you so much for joining us. You think it was successful? I think it was good. I, I think mean, we did it. The week happened. We get to have lunch now. It's that's exciting. True. My stomach's doing uh, a bit, real big growl. Yeah. Coming up next, next, we got James Duggan and Vince Ingenito, and they're playing the Division Survival Mode, where you can get real cold and frostbitten, and it's depressing. Enjoy yourselves. That's IGN's Plays Live. Coming up next, don't go anywhere. Just sit there and keep looking at the thing you're looking at. Ninja Turtles, they're here again to fight some crime and eat food in the sewer. The end. Thank you.